Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Cannabis Tech Talks. You're chopping it up with Chuck and we are here with a very special guest today. Uh, we are very excited to be able to talk to him. Uh, we have Yobi Benjamin here from the company, uh, is it 4 Inno? Actually, the company, uh, my company was acquired by PA Consulting. So uh, it is PA Consulting, and uh, we're a UK-based company. We're a consulting company, and uh, we serve various industries, everything from high-tech finance, you know, government, defense, intelligence, you name it, we do it. We're about 5,000 people. Uh, Revenue is roughly a billion and a half. And I am one of the senior partners in the United States, uh, helping run the United States. Awesome. And I uh, actually, the first time I got to meet you was at Dent. Um, I think it was a couple years ago. I believe, if I remember right, you gave a, a, a fabulous talk on, was it epigenetics? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Well, anyways, we're really excited to have you here because right now um, we are in kind of an unprecedented uh, time. Um, as far as what's happening in the world with the coronavirus. Um, and we're really excited to be able to talk to you because um, I think that you're going to bring a lot of value to our audience to talk about um, testing and even more specifically how, how uh, you believe that the cannabis companies and the labs out there are, um, are maybe set up right now to where they could help in this, uh, in this situation. Am I, am I somewhere near what, um, what, what you were saying? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, let me begin by explaining what testing really means. There's a lot of mystery around testing and testing kits. Mm-hmm. Um, in the last week, it's become part of the lingua franca of every American. Where's my test kit? Um, so a test kit really is two parts. The first part of a test kit is what the FDA calls uh, collection and transport, collection and transport device. Uh, What does that mean? Uh, It simply means that you have a medical device, uh, which could be a, uh, you know, a nasopharyngeal swab. It's a swab that you use to go up your nose to collect specimen. Uh, It goes four inches up your nose into your nasal passages, and uh, an oral swab, an oropharyngeal swab, which is, uh, which is used to collect uh, mucus uh, from the back of your, of your mouth, around the tonsils area. So that is the purpose of, of that piece. The second piece of a, uh, of a kit, a collection kit, is what's called a skirted tube or a skirted vial. It's nothing more than a plastic vial. No rocket science there. It's not even sterile. It's clean, but not sterile. Uh, The secret sauce, if you you might say, in the entire collection kit uh, um, device, and it is considered a device, believe it or not, uh, is the uh, reagent. A reagent, for those of you who don't know what it is, is simply a chemical that performs a uh, a chemical function. The reagent I use is called DNA RNA shield. Now, it's a very special reagent. The reason is when you take your sample uh, and you put that sample in the collection tube or the collection vial, Uh it automatically kills the virus. The virus is rendered harmless and safe for transportation. And that's critical because this virus is highly, highly infectious. The second function of RNA shield is it preserves the RNA. So you kill the virus and you preserve the RNA. RNA is that part of, uh, of all of our, lo- of everybody, uh, every living uh, being or thing, plants have RNA. Uh, It's an essential part of our cellular uh, makeup. That RNA is preserved by this reagent. And then after which, um, the third feature of our our, uh, our reagent is it preserves the sample for 30 days or beyond. 
Now remember that because that's significant later. The fourth function is you're able to transport the specimen in ambient room temperature, meaning just regular room temperature. Doesn't have to now, be refrigerated or anything like that. Right, that's a really good uh, observation. Most, if not all, um, reagents used in the collection of samples have to be refrigerated. Hmm. You would take the sample, you would put it in a tube, and you would put it in a usually an igloo lunchbox with ice or dry ice, and you have to transport that to the lab. The problem with that is, uh, let's just say the usual and customary reagents, uh, when you thaw and unthaw, that's called the cold cycle, uh, actually degrades RNA. And in fact, in about two days, uh, the RNA is not usable unless you get it to proper refrigeration. This presents a challenge in this coronavirus crisis because you can almost predict 100% there will be delays of getting a sample to the actual lab or the actual test equipment. Right. That is significant. Uh, so again, to repeat, it kills the virus, preserves the RNA, you're able to transport at ambient temperature and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and preserves that. And then, uh, and then uh, now let me go to the next part. <laughs> I forgot what I was gonna say there, but I think I said it already. The second part is, here's another challenge, and let's just say logistics challenge. The coronavirus or COVID-19 uh, COVID is in being extremely infectious has to be handled correctly. Now, I said earlier that the, uh, that the sample, you kill uh, the virus in the sample. Right. And then you put it in an envelope, a mylar envelope, and a second mylar envelope. So technically, that, that should be safe. Mm -hmm. However, we have to assume that we got grandma <laughs> out there who suddenly forgets that she coughed or she didn't wash her hands and therefore transferred the virus onto the plastic envelope. Yeah. The virus is not, is not active anymore. It's in a vial where it's dead. However, uh, droplets, air droplets from, I mean, spit droplets uh, from coughing or sneezing can transfer to the plastic uh, envelope. This is dangerous. There have been two studies on the infectiousness of the virus outside of the human body, one done by China CDC and one done by the National Institute of Health, uh, Princeton University and UCLA. In both studies, uh, they found that the virus stays alive outside the human body. In the CDC study, the virus stays alive for up to three days on plastic surfaces. Uh, on copper, it dies almost immediately. We don't know why. Hmm. Uh, in the China study, that was a little bit more foreboding because it lasted up to nine days on plastic. It, it's almost irrelevant whether it lasts three to nine days or, you know, or, or five minutes or one hour. What is relevant to everybody out there in your audience is that uh, this virus requires you to observe the way you live. And it's not just about the envelope. It's about the doorknobs you handle. It's about the elevator buttons you push. It's about the gas, uh, gas, uh, the, the gas in the gas station when you pull out that uh, that gas pump. It's about everything. Right. We do not know who has the virus right now because we do not have testing. So people are not able to um, quarantine themselves. Last night uh, we did a study. Uh, and frankly, it was only a single person study because one of our employees uh, had a, uh, a, you know, one of the employee, not our employee, but one, one of the employees, um, he said, I want to be tested. And we said, okay. So they went to the lab. They were totally asymptomatic, meaning they had no symptoms at all. Zero, no fever, no nothing. And after we tested them, they were positive. Uh, that's scary because the person was totally asymptomatic. Uh, and so anyway, let's go on to the second part. I hope everybody in your audience understood the first part, which is the collection and transport side. 
Right. Um, in the lab, there are three, usually uh, four steps. Uh, let me say three or four, whatever. So the first step is in the normal process, you have to remove the reagent before you process it. Using our method, you do not have to remove the reagent. You can move it immediately to what's called the purification stage. And that is preparing the RNA sample for a PCR test. Now, what is significant here is when you skip the removal of the reagent process, you're saving at least mm, maybe you know half an hour to an hour. And then, so skipping that part speeds up the test. This is not a mechanical speed up. It's merely because the nature of RNA shield is such that you don't need to do that. Now it goes to the PCR machine. It runs through its normal course, usually an hour and a half, two hours. The, stat the sample is complete and you're declared either negative or positive or no result. It's been reported that roughly 30% of uh, are getting false, false negatives. Part of the reason why there's false negatives is the collection is not done correctly. Oh. So you begin your, you, it, it begins at collection because mm -hmm. I observe uh, empirically myself, uh, some of these automotive drive-by uh, drive collection stations. And what they're doing is they're rushing people through. So you have maybe nurse aides, maybe nurses. I don't know really. I don't think they're doctors. Doctors right. do that. Right. Uh, and they take, they kind of rub 10 seconds and then on. Sometimes that's not enough. Because remember, the objective is to collect mucus. You have to observe, in fact, that there are, that there is mucus that is actively on the tip of the swab. And so, that's, that's why you got to shove it so far. That's why you got to shove it four inches into the nose to make sure you're getting that mucus. Yes. And, and in fact, you do that and in far into your, uh, by the tonsils. We're running experiments right now uh, that would allow for the collection of spit, uh, similar to what you do with 23andMe. Uh, we have not done the, uh, a quick clinical trial on that one, but if, we think it's going to succeed, and if it does, it's a far easier, safer, and more comfortable way of collection. Um, I think what I've how done there. They, oh, ahead. sorry, Yobi. How, how quickly are they getting results, accurate results, in other places doing testing? Is it? I think I've heard you know maybe four hours. Is that is that real? Is it more? Is it days? What's what's kind you know, of the status? You no, know, that's a really great question because. As you can imagine, it, it, I, I call it the testing supply chain or the testing chain. Every part of that chain takes time, collection, okay? You're moving it from collection to some central point, some central depot. From that central depot, it has to go to the lab. Remember, going to that lab requires transportation, you know? Yes. It, it, it doesn't magically fly into the lab, it has to be transported and treated as biohazard. That requires special handling. That can take a day. Mm. That alone takes a day, at minimum. So when the actual testing on the machine itself is not really that long. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about another thing that makes it long because there's a lot of people complaining, why does my sample take a long time? to the very, very few who've actually uh, been able to get uh, a test. So when you do a PCR test, uh, you, you have what's called a plate. Think about it as an egg carton, right? It looks like an egg carton, but much smaller. I wish uh, I had brought it over here. I have one. Uh, that, uh, and there's, all, in the commercial machines, there are 96 wells. They're called wells. So okay. think about, putting a bunch of um, egg cartons together and, you know, 96 of them, right? Sure. Each well contains a, 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 a material that has to be analyzed. The CDC uses a four well analysis system. Okay. That, what does that mean? 
It simply means that instead of being able to analyze 96 samples, they're able to analyze 24 samples. So that's another reason why it takes longer. Our protocol requires one, one well. And our protocol is far more uh, uh, sensitive to detecting the uh, RNA or some representation of the viral load of a, uh, of a particular, uh, of a particular uh, subject or specimen. I think that's it. Um, now, why am I talking to the cannabis people? I mean- Yeah, it, what's the connection with, uh, with cannabis here? Because it's a very, you know, it's a very scientific type of industry. People say all the time, we're cannabis and tech today. They say, what does tech have to do with cannabis? And, it, and it's got a lot to do with it. So how does that, uh, you know, how is that industry poised to, to potentially help here? So it came to my attention uh, through social media and I immediately saw it that cannabis companies, particularly the larger cannabis companies, mm -hmm. um, actually analyze the DNA of the cannabis that they that they uh, that they produce and sell, because they want to make sure that the purple haze is actually purple haze. Right. They want to make sure that you know whatever name it is is actually what it is, and. Uh, and so in or, the only way to do this is actually to run a DNA test. I mean, to sim now, now are people out there in the cannabis industry that say, oh, I look at it and I, it's purple haze. Well, <laughs> I don't really believe that because um, there's a million reasons why, but I won't get into that. The only way either. you're going to be sure is if you run a DNA analysis on, on a batch. Absolutely. And that's it. Yeah. All right. So, uh, because you have that. PCR machines, sorry, and then I'll, uh, I'll shut up, Adam, and then I'll take all your questions. Because these cannabis uh, labs have PCR machines, which are needed to analyze RNA for the coronavirus, it came to my head, then why don't we try to consolidate the, uh, the unused uh, PCR capacity of cannabis labs try to petition the government to allow cannabis labs to go and analyze uh, uh, these tests, coronavirus tests, so that we can lessen the load on the overall health system. It is, there is a huge, huge demand for this. There are 330 million Americans. And you can imagine the challenge the healthcare industry is going to go through if we have to test every single one. I would dare say that there's probably a thousand or more uh, PCR machines in the cannabis industry nationwide. And mm -hmm. these are resources that we can use as not only as a, a, for the cannabis industry, but also use to serve the needs of the American people in this very dire moment. And that's the reason why there is a connection. Is it a challenge? Yes. Uh, regulatory challenge? Yes. But you know what? Ordinary people do extraordinary things in the most difficult of times. And I think we're all in this together. Yeah, it, it, it seems to me that throughout history, whenever we faced massive challenges, that's when um, innovation seems to come through. That's when uh, companies pivot. That's when we come together. And it seems like the best you know, comes out of uh, of mankind when we really have our backs against the wall. This looks like uh, that type of challenge, doesn't it? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I mean, this is uh, I. You know, I won't say that I'm an expert in uh, in virology or genetics, but I will dare say that I've read enough and I've studied this enough. And I am, in fact, affiliated with a very large testing lab, not, uh, not cannabis, but uh -huh. very large research testing lab and medical testing lab. And I can tell you, I know more than the average person about virology and, uh, virology and uh, genetics. And given what I know and given what I've learned about this virus, this is probably the second most dangerous virus out there in terms of infectiousness, the most dangerous one is measles. 
Uh, but other than measles, this is the one. You know, it's uh, it's is it is it likes airborne? people? Is it no airborne? categorically not airborne? Categorically okay. not. You are okay. not going to be able to breathe it unless you're in front of somebody who coughs and you basically inhale droplets, air droplets from spit or droplets from coughing. That, by the way, is not the medical definition of airborne virus. That is just droplets. Okay. That, so they, they fall to the ground. They're not like floating in the air. Okay. Let me ask you this. How are celebrities and professional athletes um, getting tested when it turns out that we've seen lots of instances where people have symptoms, people have uh, been traveling abroad, they go to the doctor, and they still haven't been able to get a test um, you know, I hear a lot of people, a lot of chatter on social media saying, why, why does Kevin Durant get a test? How are they getting these, uh, these tests? Boy, I wish Just I, curious if you uh, I, boy, I wish I can speculate on that one, man. but I, 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 my speculation is simply money. Somebody yeah. has money to go and say, I don't care how much the test costs. I don't care if it's five bucks, 10 bucks, a thousand, two thousand, ten thousand, get it to me. And there's always a doctor there that's going to say, oh, 10,000 per test, no problem. Let me order one for you. Money provides access. Yeah, yeah. Sadly, oh. sadly. But we, it, it should not prevent uh, normal Americans and non-Americans, documented, undocumented, from getting the test. Because you can get as easily infected by your fellow American yeah, or you're a Latino, or you're African American, or you're Chinese. It doesn't. There is no discrimination. This is an equal opportunity virus. It doesn't care. It's going to take you down if you get it. So the virus has been in the United States, I believe, since the end of January. The first, uh, the, I believe, the first case was uh, was announced or was discovered end of January. Maybe it was like the beginning of February, and here we are. Uh, you know, middle, middle end of March, has the horse already left the stable as far as testing? Are, are we, you know, I'm just curious because it seems like we're the only industrialized nation that doesn't have the widespread testing available now. Um, and I think it's awesome that we're coming up with ideas and ways to do it. But um, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, is the horse out of the barn? Well, yes, it's very much out of the barn. Uh, <laughs> This virus is not now out there. Um, today is the 18th of March. The next seven days to 10 days are going to be explosive in the growth of both infections and mortality. Mm. It is going to be explosive. And I am not just saying that. You can look at studies from every academic institution, the CDC, the NIH, it is going to be explosive. However, it is still not too late. Why is testing important? If you remember the HIV scourge from not so long ago where we had so many infected people and they didn't know and there was you know, activity that led to even more infections. And part of the reason why we were able to stem the rise of HIV was because when people knew, they became responsible enough to tell their partner or their would-be partners that, look, I'm sick, you know, maybe we shouldn't do something. Yeah. We're in the same boat, except this is a very infectious virus. We need to know so that we don't harm our fellow human beings, so that we can quarantine ourselves. The good news about this virus, though, is this virus, um, it's easy to kill outside the human body, meaning ordinary soap and water. You do not need to buy anti-germicidal soap. You don't need to buy super expensive soap. You can use dish soap. You can use the cheapest soap. Yeah, um, just a it, regular bar of soap will work. Uh, dish soap would yes. work, <laughs> um, you know, and uh, it would work very well. It is called an envelope virus. Mm -hmm. And merely the use of a surfactant, such as soap, will kill it. Mm -hmm. uh, it also is susceptible to hydrogen peroxide. It's also susceptible to bleach, especially susceptible to bleach. 
It's susceptible to rubbing alcohol 60% or above. It's susceptible to hand sanitizers. It is a very easy virus to kill. However, if you're not careful in your daily habits, it's not unusual for you to touch your face four to six times per hour. Wow. That's where it happens. So by keeping your hands clean, it is really the best way to protect yourself. The best way to protect yourself. The other thing, too, that you should know about this virus is um, it is it is a virus that will continue, has already mutated. There are reports out of China CDC that they believe there are two mutations of the virus. Uh, so it's already behaving like any other virus. Uh, as you know, the normal flu virus, every year you get a flu shot. Well, you get a flu shot every year because it mutates and there's different strains of the flu every year. Right. It is now behaving like the flu virus and it's now mutating. It mutates uh, because it wants to live, right? It's, correct. It's, yeah. Correct, exactly. It's, uh, it wants to go and party, basically. Life, yeah, yeah. Life, life cannot be stopped, even that virus. <laughs> You know, it has a wicked and evil sense of humor. It likes to party in the human body and it likes to move around from body to body. Uh, hey, Yobi, we're going to take a, we're going to take a quick break real quick. Um, and then I'm going to come right back. This has been absolutely fascinating. We're just going to take a quick break um, and we'll be right back. Just one second. Today's episode is brought to you by Fluence by Osram. Fluence creates lighting solutions for controlled environment commercial crop production. They apply the latest research in photobiology, evidence-based design, precise engineering, and advanced technology to foster a healthier and more sustainable world. Cannabis is one of the most complex crops to grow successfully. So the experts at Fluence by Osram wrote a guide to make it easier. Check out the link below to the ultimate cannabis cultivation guide or visit www.fluence.science to learn more. Hey, everybody, we're back on Cannabis Tech Talks. You're chopping it up with Chuck, and I'm here with Yobi Benjamin. We are discussing uh, the coronavirus, the cannabis industry, um, really, really just talking about uh, some, some solutions um, and kind of the state of the state right now. Um, Yobi, uh, the cannabis industry itself, um, the, the actual act of smoking uh, cannabis seems to involve, well, I mean, let's be honest, the you pass a joint around. It's a very social experience. Um, I can tell you that I've seen a lot of changes as far as there's no more events. Um, people are changing their habits, you know, sharing, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the medicine or the cannabis is really not going on. Um, are we looking at kind of a new normal moving forward uh, because of this uh, coronavirus? Look, first and foremost, I hate to to tell you this, but one of the biggest risk factors in, um, in this, uh, that they discovered in China was smoking. Now in China, it's largely smoking tobacco, right? Mm -hmm. I can tell you that smoking is not healthy for your lungs. Your lungs is where the virus wants to live. If you smoke a lot, whether it's tobacco or, or, or cannabis, I, I would rethink that. Number one, uh, you may want to switch to edibles, you know, uh, number two, um, passing your joint around is a really bad idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a really, really bad idea. <laughs> and, uh, I, I would skip that. I, the, new, the new normal is if you want to smoke and that's your pre preference, keep it to yourself. Bring you know? your own. Yeah. Bring, bring your own, roll your own and smoke your own. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we, can we trust the data that is coming out of China? Um, yes. I know. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. The data coming out of China, even if it were, look, even if the data in China were, even if they cut it by 50%, uh -huh. it, it's still statistically correct. Let's say they underreported by half. Yeah. The, the popular, the, the number they reported is significant, statistically significant enough that it doesn't matter whether it's 50,000 or 100,000 or 200,000. Yeah. Uh, the statistical, uh, from a statistical point of view, it's already significant. So, you know, it, 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 yes, we can trust the Chinese. I trust the Chinese. We were first respond, my one of my companies uh, 
you know, uh, Zymo Research was a first responder to Wuhan. The moment it hit Wuhan, we sent uh, our testing kits over to Wuhan, uh, hundreds of thousands of testing kits to China, and they immediately took it, immediately. Uh, I do want to bring up one point here. I would like your uh, audience to uh, call your respective uh, Congress people, your senators, your state and local officials to encourage the government to allow for in-home testing. What is that? For people to be able to uh, test themselves for the virus. The reason is our healthcare system is already overwhelmed. Yes. There are too many people. And you know, why would you want somebody who's potentially sick to hang around your doctor's office or go elsewhere when they can test themselves in the comfort of their own homes and then trans have that thing uh, safely mailed over to, uh, to a lab? So please, if I have one plea for this, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, podcast, please write to your congressman, call your governor, Call your senator and tell them to please tell the FDA to allow for in-home testing. Right now, the FDA is stopping us from actually doing in-home testing. They did a press release that said, uh, oh, yeah, we're, we're okay with it. You can do in-home testing. The very same day, by the way, they put that in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, they sent me, they sent one of my companies, Zymo Research, uh, a letter requesting a clinical study. Hmm. Now, just to let you know, a clinical study is not something you do overnight. It right. takes a very long time. It is complicated, takes a long time, and it's actually not needed. Not in this case, because the product specifically that is uh, being uh, sold by one of my companies, Zymo Research, the collection tubes, is already approved in a clinical setting. Meaning if a doctor or a nurse uh, uses the swab, it's approved, mm. period. It's okay. But it's not approved if you do it. So where does that make sense? I don't know. Doctors don't want to see you. Nurses don't want to see you. You don't want to see them. Right. So what's the option? Wow. So we're going to get our audience involved. We're going to reach out. People, you've got time on your hands right now. It's a great time to get engaged. It's a great time to innovate. It's a great time to, um, you know, to pivot and see how we can come together as a community. There's going to be challenges over the next couple of months. Um, it's going to be really important that we, uh, you know, that, we, that we stay engaged and that we're alert um, and pay attention and look out for each other. Is, Yobi, is there any truth? Did this come from... Did, where, where did this come from? Did it come from a, do you know, did it come from a bat? Is yes. That, yes. It was a bat? Yes, it's, a zo it's called a zoonotic disease. It came from an animal, it transferred to human beings. Um, and you know what? You're not, it's, it's, unfortunately, the world doesn't eat like Americans, right? Right. I mean, certain cultures eat certain things and, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but I think right now China has made an effort to ban the eating of wild animals, and I think that'll help. Um, every country has now passed, like, almost every country has passed legislation to stop that practice. It's still very difficult because there are some communities that it's part of the way they live, and you know it's a reality. And and again, Charles, uh, it's our new normal. Our new normal is this virus lives with us. It will kill some of us. The good news is it will only kill roughly 2% of us. Yeah. You know, 2%, unfortunately, from the American, from an American point of view, is a fairly large number. That is roughly, oh, give or take 5 million people, you know, yeah. so it's not yeah. a good number. Well, Yobi, thank you so much for, uh, for your time, for coming on here. I'm sure we'll reach back out again. Um, if, if any of our audience wants to, uh, to find out more information or to reach you, can you give them um, you know, maybe a website? or, or Yeah, some uh, we're going to be launching a website within the next two days, uh, but you can reach me at hello at yobi.com. Hello at yobi.com. Um, that'll be easier. So okay. thank you very much, everybody. Charles. Yeah, be, thank you so much for all your hard work. Listen, everybody on the front line of this, the researchers, the medical workers, the, you know, the people that are out here keeping it going, we really need to salute them because uh, um, you guys are, you guys are working your asses off and we really appreciate it. So again, thank you so much, Yobi. We appreciate your time. We'll check back in with you and uh, 
Late, thanks again, everybody. You've been chopping it up with Chuck here on Cannabis and Tech Talks. Uh, make sure that you stay tuned, subscribe, and uh, we'll continue to bring you more information as, uh, as it becomes available. And uh, don't forget to follow us on social media so you can stay in the conversation and visit our website, canatechtoday.com.